All right, friends, you're in for a treat because we're exploring the question of the evidence for a 13th century exodus. What's the biblical evidence? What's the extra biblical evidence? What are the challenges to this theory? And my guest today, Michael Jones, is a philosopher. You recognize him from the Inspiring Philosophy YouTube channel, but he's done a ton of thinking recently in videos and interviewed experts on the exodus. And he has switched his mind, we're gonna get into this, to embracing a 13th century exodus. Now, Michael, you don't pretend to be an Egyptologist, don't pretend to be an archeologist. My hope in this video is that we would just kind of give a 30,000 foot view of what's at stake here. The best evidence for 13th century exodus, consider challenges against it. And then in due time down the road, I'm gonna have a couple scholars on from both sides to get lost in the weeds. So first off, thanks for coming on. But second, how does that approach sound to you? Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And yeah, I, I'm definitely not an Egyptologist, but I work closely with them. Um, my documentary series was reviewed by experts like David Falk, Benjamin Noonan, Joshua Berman. Uh, so you know, I try to work closely with the experts on this. And that's one of the reasons I did change my view. The experts uh, basically said that it's much this, there's much more evidence here. So let, let's help you out. And I, I decided that that was the best, best approach to take. Well, I appreciate your willingness to change your mind. Somebody commented early on and said, why would you have Michael on? He took a video down and got things wrong. And I thought, well, he took it down, as far as I can tell, owned his mistakes and said, I want to learn from this and then make a better argument with scholars on my side. Is that a fair assessment of how you see it went down? That, that's exactly how it went down. I put up a, a video arguing for the 15th century exodus. It was critiqued. I talked privately with the Egyptologist David Falk about a lot of the issues and we went through a lot of stuff. Uh, he we checked this out, we checked that out, and eventually it was just, the evidence was just definitely pointing in that direction. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to encourage people that when you find new data, you should update your views, uh, that it, you should try to follow the data as best, you lead, as best as possible, and not dig your heels in on a view and mm -hmm. not let evidence lead you. I love that. Well, we're gonna get to some questions at the end. So if you have questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat, but also, uh, copy and paste them so you can put them at the end and they don't get lost in so many comments. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious before we jump in, just a few questions for you. Of all the issues you could study, especially with a philosophy background, what interested you in the question of the historical exodus? Well, I, I love studying archaeology to begin with, and it's mm -hmm. always been something I've just, it, I think a lot of people are just really interested in the past and everything around that. What got me interested in it was a documentary called Patterns of Evidence, which argues for an entirely mm -hmm. different exodus view. And I was like, wow, there might be something here. And then I studied the data and was like, no, I don't think so. But I was still interested in the exodus. And then I moved to the 15th century and then the 13th century exodus date. Okay. And I'm just the kind of guy that just, I can't stay in one spot. I want to study so many different things. Like I, I like moving around and jumping. I mean, next year I'll probably be in New Testament or maybe philosophy, who knows? I just like studying different things. I love it. That's similar to me in some ways as well. Well, let's let's jump in. Tell us what are some of the things of why you shifted your view? Because the 15th century, I'm not sure in terms of numbers. I haven't weighed scholars, but that's a very popular conservative position. You shifted about two centuries earlier, and we're going to get into some of the weeds. But what are some of the big pieces that got your attention and said, wow, maybe I need to reassess this? Yeah. So... The 15th century exodus is the idea the exodus happened around 1446 BC. 13th century puts it about 1265 BC, under the time of Ramesses II. And to be fair, Egyptologists that are titans in the field, like Kenneth Kitchen, James Hoffmeyer, and Falk as well, will tell you that the majority of scholars that look at this and believe in a historical exodus basically point to around the 13th century. That's where the data seems to point to. One of the biggest pieces for me was when I was reading our proponents for the 15th century exodus, they said that the city of Avaris, which was a Semitic, Semitic city, very likely where Israel would have been uh, living in and around, they said it was abandoned during the time of Amenhotep II, so around the 1400s. What I found was is that's not the case. Hmm. What I found was is that they have misread the archaeologist that works at the site, Tel Odava, uh, Manfred Bitek. He talks about how there was an abandonment around the time of Amenhotep II, but it is when the native Egyptians abandoned the palatial district. So the Semitic population that was focused around the temple there stayed there. And he will, and Btech will say there was a Semitic population living there until the, basically the Ramesside period. 
So it was abandoned, but it wasn't abandoned until the Ramazite period. Uh, the, the abandonment that he was talking about during Amenhotep around that time, that was when the native Egyptians abandoned the palatial district. So there wasn't this big Semitic abandonment. When I realized that with talking to Dr. Falk, I was like, okay, there's some problems here. And I was reading the quotes directly from BTEC and seeing where the error had happened. And I was like, well, this is the key point for the Exodus when this city was abandoned, when the, when the Semitic population left. Where, whenever that happened, that's going to be the best case for the Exodus. So that was like the first the crack, I guess you could say, in the dam that led to the floodgate opening up. Okay. So interestingly enough, it was an extra biblical piece of evidence that got your attention primarily and then made you reassess some of the biblical evidence, which of course doesn't mean the biblical evidence is wrong. you got to start somewhere, but uh, that's that's totally fair. That makes sense. Okay, maybe explain before we get into some of the details, why do scholars land on the 13th century? How do they come up with that date, whether biblically or extra biblically? Good question. Uh it has to, to do a lot with what Exodus records. So sometimes you'll see things like updated place names in the Bible. Like it talks about in Genesis 14, uh, Abraham went into the land of Dan. Scholars think that, you know, well, that his great grandson had not been born yet. So this might be an updated place name. But Exodus 1 doesn't really refer to it as an updated place name. It says the Hebrews built Peth, store cities at Pithom and Ramesses. That implies that they had to be there to do the act of building. It's not this idea that like they pass through this area and we're going to update the place name. It specifically says they were building store cities here. That, that's an action. It's not just an updated place name like updating the land of Dan or, or of the Chaldeans in Genesis 11. This is a specific action. Then when we get to the Exodus account itself, we see that Moses and Aaron are talking to the Pharaoh a lot, very frequently going back and forth. During the 15th century Exodus time period, the capital was in Thebes. That's down in Upper Egypt, so southern yeah. Egypt, very, very far away. Uh, that's where the pharaoh would have spent most of his time. That's where the court was. That's where his family was. That's where his harem was. That's where he's going to spend most of his time. He's not going to be in the north. During the 19th dynasty, so sometime around the 1300 and after, the capital was moved to a brand new city called P. Ramesses. And that was about two kilometers from the site of Avaris. Okay. So you can have much more communication with the Pharaoh. He's right there. And it explains mm. how, why, you know, the Mo Moses is able to talk to the Pharaoh so much. He's just sort of right then and there instead of him having to travel all the way to Thebes and all the way back. So it fits with what we see in Exodus about them being there to construct the city, the store cities at Pithom and Ramesses, and it being so close to where the Pharaoh would have been residing. If it's an 18th century Exodus, it should have taken, you know, days, weeks to get down the Nile to communicate with the Pharaoh at Thebes. Okay, that's interesting. So it was a geographical difference of where the Israelites would have been or the slaves and where the Pharaoh would have been to have the interaction during the time of the plagues that tells you the story doesn't fit if it was at a different time chronologically. Is that fair? Correct. Correct. Okay. And also the fact that when the 10th plague happened, the Pharaoh's with his son, uh, Typically, the family would stay in the royal city. They're not going to be up north at Avaris at this, this small palatial area that, again, was abandoned around the time of Amenhotep. So it doesn't really fit with a lot of the details we read in the Exodus account. Okay. All right. Got it. Friends, just join us. We're here with Michael Jones talking about his case for 13th century Exodus. When we get to the end, we're going to take your questions, but we're going to keep uh, brewing on. Let's talk, what about biblically? Obviously, we're going to come back to the standard dating from 1 Corinthians 6, 1 in the 480 years that dates to 446 for the 15th century. We'll talk about that. But those who make... What did I say? 1 Corinthians. And I oh, 1 like, Corinthians. Hey, I don't know what I'm saying. 1 <laughs> um, Kings. Thank you. You meant what I knew. Uh, mm -hmm. But the passage that's often cited is Exodus 1, 11 being foundational for 13th century view. Why is that biblical text so vital? Well, it's like, as I was just saying, uh, it says they were there to build store cities at Pithom and Ramesses. Okay. Yeah, so we know for, and Pithom we know was basically abandoned around the time of Moses III, Hatshetsu, uh, and then it was resettled during the 19th dynasty. So we know that, you know, it was basically being, that, that 
there was work happening there, but not until the 19th dynasty. There's this big gap period there. Same with Ramesses. Ramesses is not, the city P. Ramesses is not constructed until the beginning of the 19th dynasty. If the book of Exodus says the Hebrews were there to construct source, store cities there, they could not have left prior to this. And that's a big problem for the 15th century Exodus. Okay, got it. So that's the central passage. Now, before we go any further, is this a question of biblical inerrancy? Is this a question of biblical authority? Or is it just a different question of biblical interpretation and understanding of the historical record? It's, I would say this is not a problem for biblical authority. This is a, problem, this is a question of biblical interpretation. Uh, we need to understand that we are fallible. Sometimes we may misunderstand what God was trying to say in his word, and we need to study the cultural context. John Walton has a good phrase. He says, the Bible was not, the Bible's written for us, but it wasn't written to us. We have to understand the audience it was written to, to best understand what God is trying to say for us. So sometimes we may take things in the Bible literally, but that's not how the culture that received the text would have. And when it comes to First Kings, when it talks about 480 years uh, bef- uh, from Tol- Solomon's temple to the Exodus, we have to understand in the ancient Near East, there were temple dedication genre that would happen. So you would use symbolic numbers when you would talk about dedicating a temple. For example, in Egypt, there is something called the 400-year stele, which dates to around the time of Seti I. This is mm-hmm. Ramadis II's father. It says that they rededicated the temple of Seth in the 400th year on the fourth month on the fourth day. Now, the earliest this could have been made was around 1320 BC. The problem is the temple was not 400 years old. It's about 50 years off. Okay. So we know they're using a symbolic number to talk about this temple dedication. Now, the Hebrews are going to come out of this culture. They're going to have the same kind of ideas. We also see the same thing in Assyria and other places as well. This is what you did when you dedicated a temple. You used this symbolic type number. You did not use the literal dating necessarily. You didn't have to. So when we look at 1 Kings, we need to understand it in its cultural context, what they're doing with temple dedication inscriptions. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so it's helpful for people to understand that this is not a question about inerrancy and authority, as far as I can tell. It's interpretation. I went back and actually looked at our, in the Evidence Demands Verdict that updated with my father, the chapter on Exodus, because it had been two, three years plus since I looked at it. And we present the case for the Exodus, historical Moses, and the strengths and weaknesses for the early dating and the late dating, and say that evangelicals don't have to land on that. And I think that's a, a fair way, as far as I can tell to approach in this. Okay. One of the things I found, a lot of people when they look at historical questions don't have a careful methodology. So when I did my research on the apostles, I spent a lot of time laying out, here's the sources I'm going to look at. Here's the time period. Here's how I'm going to assess them as best as I could. Had a careful methodology. Now, when I had on Dr. Titus Kennedy to make the case for the 15th century Exodus, he has a very simple, I think powerful methodology of kind of what he calls an A to B approach. So is there evidence uh, before the Exodus for Semitic or potentially Israelites in Egypt making bricks, being enslaved? Does the Pharaoh match up? You move chronologically through and look for supporting archaeological evidence. That's his methodology. What's yours? Well, I, I'm perfectly fine with that methodology. I think that that is helpful for external evidence itself. When we look at what evidence on the ground confirms the biblical account. I also say we need to look at internal evidence as well. We need to look at the account of Exodus itself. Are we going to see internal markers that point to a very old tradition, something that would date to the late Bronze Age, something that's going to align with an Egyptian culture? Because if this was like, I don't know, made up by later Jews living in the Babylonian exile, they're going to have markers that's more going to align with cultural affinity of like Babylon. But do we have evidence that shows that there's a lot of internal evidence supporting a late in Egyptian culture? I'm sorry, early in Egyptian culture. And in my documentary series, Exodus Rediscovered, I give a lot of those internal markers when it comes to like loan words, early names, affinity with cultural customs. These yeah. tend to point to a very uh, early date for the Exodus in alliance with an Egyptian culture. We'll walk through some of those, and I've linked to your uh, documentary below. Great quality, easy to follow, interesting uh, really, really helpful. I p- hope people who are engaged in this question will take the time to watch it. Let's talk about a couple things biblically. 
that are often used for 15th century date. And then I want you to walk through with me what you consider some of the best pieces of archaeological evidence mm -hmm. for the 13th century date. So one of the standard uh, means of dating is, of course, 1 Corinthians 6, 1. And the 400 years after the Israelites came out of Egypt in Solomon's fourth year, which can be dated to 966 when he began building the temple. You do the math, adds to 1446, middle of the 15th century. That seems pretty straightforward. How do you, I know maybe this is the best way to put it, but how do you get around that interpretation or assessment of data when it seems to be so straightforward? You're really stuck on that Corinthians, aren't you? Oh man. <laughs> it's all right. I don't wanna, I don't want people to bother you in the comments, so I'll bring it up now. But so again, as I was talking earlier, this is about a temple dedication. We see this, for example, uh, with another temple dedication. Uh, Tikulti Ninurta the first does the same thing when he's doing a temple dedication. He declares 720 years elapsed from when the temple was constructed, constructed when he's rededicating it. In Assyria, they used uh, 60 a lot. 60 times 12 gets you 720. This is a symbolic number. But in Canaan, okay. they use 40. 40 times 12 gets you 480. That really tends to point to this idea of using symbolic uh, usage of numbers when it comes to temple temple dedications. And again, we see the same thing in Egypt, like I mentioned earlier, with the 400 year stela. Uh, it, I don't think this is necessarily meant to give you exact chronology, but what we but, and what we should go on is what the book of Exodus is telling us. What are the internal clues? For example, all the toponyms that are used in there, like Migdal, Balsafon, Pithom, Ramesses, these all point to a 19th century time period. We don't see a lot of these toponyms being used earlier during the 18th century, especially the toponym P. Ramesses. The toponym Ramesses is very important because it wasn't used after the 10th century in Egypt, and it wasn't used before the uh, 1300s. So that really pinpoints the time period when we're getting the Exodus account. If it was written later, they'd be using uh, the, the later toponym, which would be like the field of Zoan. If it was written earlier, they would not be using that because the city wasn't built yet. So the toponyms themselves point to 19th century date. The closeness of the pharaoh, like I talked about earlier, uh, points to a 19th century date. The fact that they were there to build store cities at Pithom and Ramesses, which were not being worked on until the 19th dynasty, again, points to the uh, the late date for the Exodus. It does not point to the early date. Okay, so these periods, typically the way I hear people describe the 480 years is that it's a, a derivative of 12 in some fashion. And that might be the wrong word, but it's a number of generations, what is it, 40 times 12, a biblical number, 40 times 12. and you arrive at this, and numbers are not often meant to be in particular the number 40, not meant to be taken as precise. This is an argument that Hoffmeyer makes. He says, for example, if you take the chronologies, I believe, in Judges, and you add the math, it's not 480 years, it's like 633 years, and of course, there's ways that 15th century uh, supporters will push back on that. But basically, to understand when it comes to the 480 years, you would, you would have to take the position this is not meant to be a literal 480 years, but the Bible is meaning something different by that rather than giving us a strict chronology. Right. right. And we see support of that in Exodus 4, for example. So okay. Moses was said to be 80 years at the start of the Exodus, according to the Exodus 7 7. Acts 30 says he spent 40 years in Midian. But let me read Exodus 4 20. It says, So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey, and they went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took his staff. That poor donkey, having his wife and his two grown sons who have been there for a long time, if he's been there for a total of 40 years. Okay. So Ernst Axel Knopf says, a 40 years indicates that it was a long time of unknown extent. It's a round figure. It's like saying, oh, you know, about 10 years ago or oh, about, you know, a generation or so ago. That's kind of what you're saying there. It's not meant to be a literal number. It's just meant to be a general time frame that is an unknown extent. Okay, fair enough. Now, here, let me just pause for a second because here's a question that's going to come up. And I see how you respond to this. It's a picture of Sam Harris. So I know it's not actually from Sam Harris. Unless he's watching, that'd be awesome. He's going to say, is anything literal in the Bible? So one's going to say, if you open up the floodgates to interpret this non-literally, where do we stop? All right. Well, nice to meet you, Sam. Uh, this is a slippery slope fallacy. 
there are clearly places in the Bible that are not literal. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Uh, Genesis 2.24, a man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one flesh. Okay, we're not literally being sewed up together. Let, let's use some typical methodology we would use when we study any other text. Sometimes they're a metaphor. Sometimes it's literal. We got to understand the context and know what it is. If I told you I saw a car flying down the road, you're smart enough to understand the car and the road are literal, but flying is a metaphor for me to mean go fast. You can use metaphors in a sentence with literal terms. We don't have to have this slippery slope fallacy where it's all going to be all literal or it's all going to be all metaphorical. We wouldn't do that with any other text. Okay, fair enough. So back to the question of inerrancy, the question would be then, what do the authors intend to convey by using these numbers? And if we can do our best to assess that, either it's a large period of time or either it's 40 years, doesn't open up the floodgates that therefore nothing can be understood literally and directly and chronologically. That's the challenge of interpretation. Okay, fair enough. What about the passage that sometimes used? How do you respond in Judges 11, 26, and with which Jephthah stated in a letter to the king of Ammon, uh, quote, for 300 years, Israel occupied Hezbon, Erorier, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, the surrounding settlements and all the towns of Arnon. Now, scholars would estimate that his judgeship was somewhere between like 1130 and 1073 BC. So that would seemingly more line up with the 15th century uh, dating than the 13th century. Your thoughts? Right. And I used to think this as well, but it's kind of ironic okay. that early day proponents use this because remember, we have to remember in the book of Judges, the judges are not necessarily doing everything right. They're getting a lot of things wrong. Like Samson is not a good judge. That's true. It's arranged sort of like in a, in a topo, topological fashion. Good judges come first, then we go degrade to get the bad judges. Jephthah is towards the end, so he's not really a good judge. This is his attempt at failed diplomacy. Notice what he says. He says, will you not possess what Chemosh your God has given you? Now, if you understand ancient Canaan, Chemosh was not the God of Ammon. He was the God of Moab. So he gets the mm -hmm. deity wrong. He also gets a lot of the history wrong. This is him attempting his fail. This is failed diplomacy. This is why the king of Ammon just ignores it because he got so many things wrong. He just doesn't know what he's doing. And this is why after he's got to take that very tragic vow. Uh, because, you know, he's like, I, I really screwed up. I need something to try to make this a victorious win. So Je Jephthah is not the most accurate information. And the authors okay. are literally telling us, they're telling us, look at all the stuff he's getting wrong. So how can you trust him on this when he can't even get mm. the deity right of Ammon and as well as the history of Ammon right? There's a lot of problems here. So this is not a good, reliable source of information. Uh, I would highly recommend we use more reliable sources. The authors of Judges are directly telling us Jephthah is not a reliable source. Okay, got it. So the simple point is that the book of Judges is not saying this period is 300 years, but it's on the lips of Jephthah. And even the right. book Judges itself is pointing out that he's not a reliable witness. Uh, okay, Correct. interesting. Now, I know some of you watching this, if you're in favor of the 15th mm -hmm. century, you're thinking, but, 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 there's responses. Totally get it. We will come back, and in due time, I'm going to bring some scholars on from both sides, and we will get into the weeds of this. I'm anxious to hear myself. Now we're just hearing what are the big evidences for, big evidences against, how do you respond to some of the big questions, and what's the 13th century debate, uh, what, is it, what does it look like? Now, here's a comment, and this leads us perfectly to our next point. Uh, Velkin says there's also the problem of finding no oh you know what that was the wrong one I'm going to take that out that is my bad there's there's a comment above that's what I get for not paying attention there is no historical case for Exodus the simple fact that none of Egypt's enemies noticed that they lost all their food and uh, I can't see that part and a good part of the population is all one needs to know now first off Velkin thank you for watching and for commenting this leads us to the question of the evidence so convince us michael you've gone public arguing for a 13th century exodus you've sent me dozens and dozens of pieces you think of evidence funnel them down let's maybe do two three at most four but give us some you of the it. individual pieces let's start there that you think are good for a 15th century exodus go well first i want to just quick quickly address the objection none of their enemies had mentioned the exodus let's remember a lot of what's from the ancient world is a, we have a fraction of the documents from the ancient world. There was a scriptorium found at Avaris uh, with 400 uh, like seal impressions all rotted away because 
ancient documents were not made to last. 99% of ancient documents were just missing. So that's not a good argument. In terms of evidence for the Exodus, all of it points to the 13th century. As I mentioned earlier, Avaris was, there was a Semitic population living in the Nile Delta around Avaris until the Ramazide period. After that, Manfred B. Tech says the site was used as a cemetery by the native Egyptians. So that Semitic population went somewhere else. What we see about 40 years or a generation so later is there was a population explosion in Canaan. And this is admitted by even people skeptical of the Exodus, like Israel Finkelstein, William Deaver. There's a huge population of explosion. New sites, uh, de novo. And these new sites are the beginning of the Israelite material culture. They also lack pig bones. The site of Avaris earlier also lacked pig bones as well. So around the time of the Ramazai period, site of Avaris is abandoned. They lack pig bones. About a generation or so later, a population explosion happens in Canaan. And uh, these new sites lack pig bones. Additionally, we see that the site Havazor, that's mentioned in the book of Joshua, is burned. And the idols at Hazor were mutilated in typical Israelite fashions. So whoever attacked the city burned it and then mutilated the idols. Uh, and I'll give you one more piece before we can move on. But at the same time, Mount Ebal has, an, has a site set on it that dates to around the time of the 1200s. It cannot date earlier, despite what early date proponents have argued. The archaeologists do not state that. It dates to around the time of the 1200s. It's an altar site. We found ashes there of uh, dead uh, ashes representing deer, goats, sheep, cow, correlating again with what we see in Joshua 8. So Avaris is, so recap, Avaris is abandoned uh, around the time of the Ramazide period. Generation or so later, population of explosion in Canaan. Hazor is burned. Idols are mutilated. Mount Ebal's site is created around that same time period. All the archaeological data, and I found this out the hard way, but all the archaeological data points to a 13th century exodus. It does not point to a 15th century. Okay, Avaris is where Goshen is, correct? That's correct. what the biblical description is. So let's take this one. You're saying if the Israelites lived there, the evidence matches the 13th century exodus in terms of that area being abandoned at that time, not earlier. So if there were millions or even if there were, if that number is mistakenly translated and it's tens of thousands, it still matches up with abandonment uh, during the period of the 13th century. That's the first piece, correct? Correct. Okay. And then we find big groups, I think you described it, make sure I'm tracking here, in the area of Canaan that are distinctly Israelites in the 13th century uh, that would match an infusion if there were an exodus at that time. Is that correct? Right. Right. We okay. see all brand new sites de novo sprouting up around the end, around 1200 or so. Okay. All right. Now, one of the ways that uh, Bryant Wood argued in the Evangelical Theological Society Journal, this is a few years ago, he went back and forth with Hoffmeyer on the Exodus, was that there's no evidence in terms of the conquest of Jericho about 40 years after. So I think that would be moving into uh, early 1200s BC or so, maybe 1210, maybe 1220, uh, for an occupation. And that's when I believe uh, Kitchen would date it towards. And mm -hmm. his argument is that Kitchen kind of says, well, we wouldn't expect to find anything. It's all been lost. And so there's just no evidence there, but we wouldn't expect it. Now, that was from a few years ago, so maybe they found stuff. But tell mm -hmm. me how a 13th century exodus would match shortly later the conquest, which falls in the biblical chronology. Okay, so the latest reports by Lorenzo Nigro came out in 2020 on Jericho. So we have the latest reports now. They, it, the latest reports do not support the early date for the conquest. They support a late date. One of the things they, he, he noted in his work is that there was this something happened at Jericho called site leveling. And that is later builders during the Iron Age, during the Roman period, the Byzantine period, cut in to the late Bronze Age, late Bronze Age layers, removing them. So it's not that we don't have we've looked and we see, well, there was no destruction at this point. It's we've looked and we've realized those layers were tampered with and destroyed by later occupants on the site. And this happens a lot. That's why Kitchen talks about a lot of the data has been removed. He was aware of that even back then before these latest reports came out. 
So that, that's an issue right then and there. But the latest reports also show that the destruction layer that Brian Wood points to could not be Joshua's destruction because it's the wrong type of wall. They also showed evidence of battering rams at that destruction. And the overwhelming majority of archaeologists do not agree with Brian Wood's dating. They agree that it's 1515 BC. Brian Wood wanted to move it up to 1400. But the overwhelming majority still agree with Kathleen Kenyon it's 1550. But even if you could move that destruction up, it doesn't matter because it doesn't fit Joshua's destruction. Wrong type of wall, wrong type of uh, destruction with battering rams. But the latest reports did re reveal something interesting, that there was the site was still occupied through the uh, the uh, 13th through the uh, 14th century and into the 13th century, so the time period of the Exodus. Then something happened. We're not entirely sure because we're, we still need to do more research on the site. But the fortified site there that was existing during the time of Joshua, 13th, uh, 13th century, it disappeared. And it was replaced by a small village in the 11th century. So something happened in this period. We're not entirely sure because, again, site leveling happened. But there was a fortified mud brick structure there during the 1400s, during the 1300s, and into the 1200s. And then sometime after that, something happened. The site was replaced by a small village. So the walled city went away. We don't know because, again, sometimes this happens. Later builders tampered. But it does fit, at least, with the 13th century exodus. It does not support the 15th century exodus. Okay, so in some ways you're making a similar case that uh, Dr. Kennedy makes. And if those of you want to see a 15th century, I link to it below. I think it's one of the best straightforward, just systematic cases for a 15th century exodus that needs to be part of this larger conversation. But you're chronologically saying a group of people that match the Israelites, when they leave and it's destroyed, when they show up in the desert, when they could have done the conquest, matches the 13th century. So you're making really a similar approach that he does, but you just assess the facts differently. That gets me excited to have some of the scholars on later and get into these weeds, but now is not the time. Uh, fair enough. I understand where you're coming from. Let's talk about some, you sent me this list of what you think are some of the best individual pieces of evidence uh, for the Exodus. One of them is the high amount of Egyptian loan words. Why do you think that's significant? And maybe explain to people tracking who are not familiar with what that is, what you mean by a loan word. Sure. This is probably one of my favorite pieces of evidence for the Exodus. This was put out by Benjamin Noonan, who's a great scholar, reviewed my Exodus documentary series, helped out it, uh, made some corrections as well. But he studied the loan words in Exodus. These are Egyptian words that are in the Hebrew Bible. They're loan words. The Hebrews got them from Egyptian, the Egyptian language. And he notes there is a significant amount of Egyptian loan words in the book of Exodus through numbers. I mean, we're talking like higher proportions than any other ancient work. So what he does is he points out there's a high amount of loan words. Then he compares it to other languages in the Levant, like Ugaritic, Edomite, Moabite. They have very few, if none, Egyptian loan words. Yet the Hebrews had dozens within the Exodus account. Uh, this implies they have some sort of Egyptian origin to have this high amount. He also compares it to old Iranian loan words in Ezra and Nehemiah. So we know that would have been coming from a Persian culture, but there's more Egyptian loan words in the Exodus account than there is in Ez than there are old Iranian words in Ezra and Nehemiah. He then says the only language that comes close to the amount of loan words uh, in the Exodus account is Imperial Aramaic texts. Hmm. But what's interesting is the Imperial, Imperial Aramaic texts that have a lot of Egyptian loan words come from documents from Egypt. And Exodus has more loan words than even the Imperial Aramaic uh, text. So that implies whoever was writing the Exodus account had such affinity with the Egyptian culture and the Egyptian language, it's likely they would have been there in Egypt. Then he goes even a step further. He points out the loan words uh, have a specific ending that fits with the time period of the Late Bronze Age. So it doesn't fit with the later Iron Age influence. It fits with Late Bronze Age period. So it points to authors that were familiar with the Egyptian language likely would have been in Egypt to be familiar with the language uh, and the time period that we would expect the Exodus to come from. Okay, so let me just sum it up for people tracking. Loan words are words that are in the Hebrew Bible, but they have roots that would come from the Egyptian language or culture in some fashion, which show not necessarily a borrowing, but an influence from this culture which the fact that we see it in the Exodus narrative, which describes when 
the Israelites are leaving Egypt. Hence, and this is a only scholars would discover this, right? It right. hints that, that they're not trying to signal this. It's kind of indirect evidence that there was a deep influence from Egypt showing up in this book, not as much in other books in the Bible, and not as much as other books outside of the scriptures. Now, do you think this uniquely supports a 13th century exodus, or would this also support a 15th century exodus? Does it matter? Is it date specific, or does it just argue for an exodus regardless of when it happened? Noonan, I asked about this, he says it could support either. Now, okay. he favors a 13th century exodus, to be fair, but okay. he says it would support either. It's just a general time period we see that it comes about. Okay, that's helpful. That's that's good to know. Now, looking at the list you have right here, pick maybe one or two others that you think just kind of jump out. I think the loan words are a good argument. I've seen uh, Hoffmeyer make this argument for a while. Maybe grab one more piece. Let's just stick stick there for now before we go to questions that you think is significant. And I see dozens of these uh, listed right here, whether it's geology, the need for a Moses-type figure, uh, the ark. Give me one more you find compelling, Michael. I think a good one is the ark of the covenant itself. Uh, now, you can talk with Dr. Falk more about this. He's an expert on this, but he studied Egyptian ritual furniture. And just like we today update styles uh, you know, no one's going to build a house like they did in the 1800s. We are going to build houses in modern style. The Egyptians also updated ritual furniture. The Ark of the Covenant matches basically from the time of Amenhotep III to around the 10th century or so, maybe a little bit earlier than that. So it fits right with the Ramazide period, the way that it's designed in the, in the style, the customs of the time period. Even scholars that don't believe in Nexus, like Scott Noble, will note that the Ark of the Covenant fits with the Ramazide period. It really does align with how they were designing ritual furniture, cultic chess at this time period. So it really does point to a time period after Amenhotep III, which discounts the early date, because they want to say Amenhotep, the Pharaoh was Amenhotep II. But we don't see the style we see with the Ark of the Covenant until Amenhotep III af and afterwards. It fits very much with the Ramazide time period. But that also doesn't support the skeptics' view, which is that this is a later myth built on it. Uh, myth makers are not going to be able to construct Egyptian ritualistic furniture from centuries before knowing the customs exactly. And to give you an analogy, could you, without using the internet or libraries, tell me what a, a chest would have looked like in Spain 300 years ago? Probably not. It'd be very hard. You have to look at pictures. But that's the kind of where they would be in this ancient culture, but they somehow were able to tell us how the Ark of the Covenant looked, matches exactly what we see from ritualistic chests from that time period when we would expect the Exodus to have occurred. Okay, so when we look at the Exodus description of the Ark, whether it's the two cherubim, the direction that they're faced, that matches similar descriptions from Egypt from that time. So that seems to show an Egyptian influence. Now, I imagine some people would say, yeah, that's just because it's borrowed and it's copied from Egypt. Now, I imagine the response might be is, for example, when it talks about the historicity of Moses, some people point out that there's a number of stories of people that similarly put in a basket, uh, abandoned, found, that kind of broadly match the Moses story. But there's also some very unique differences in Moses that can't be described away as just copying. It's too unique for that. Is that the same point that you're making when it comes to the Ark of the Covenant? Yes, it very much is. It's very unlikely to have been a myth. It matches too much with late Bronze Age Egyptian culture and styles concerning Egyptian ritual chess. Okay, gotcha. All right, uh, what do you consider, uh, for somebody who supports the 15th century uh, Exodus. What would you say are some of the biggest objections that they need to address and answer? So if somebody's watching this, uh, that they, let's go, we can do two or three, but just lay out, let's start with one. You think the biggest objection, maybe it's back to the beginning, what started to shift your mind is fine, but what are some of the biggest potholes and problems for a 15th century Exodus, whether biblically or extra biblically? Well, I think there, there's a lot now that I've been looking into this for a long time some of the biggest challenges are to be honest there's just not a lot of good evidence for it when it comes to the conquest we don't see population change explosion happen like we see 
with the late date for the Exodus. We don't see an abandoned city, the abandoned city of Varus happening around this time. We also just don't see the book of Exodus fits with their account in, in Egypt at the time. Again, the Pharaoh was living much further south. It would have taken days for Moses to go back and forth, weeks, to commune with the Pharaoh. It's just unlikely. Uh, we see a lot of these issues, and a lot of the evidence they use is just not, there's a lot of holes in it. I had Egyptologist David Falk on my channel a couple months ago, and we went through a lot of these arguments early day proponents use, like the Shashu of Yahweh inscription, or like we talked about earlier, the using Jephthah. Uh, and he went through and attacked them all. He also has his own channel, by the way, called Anci Ancient Egypt in the Bible that you all should really check out. A lot of good stuff on there where he challenges early day proponents on this stuff as well. So there's just a lot of problems. I think on the surface, the early date sounds really good. And then when you just start digging a little deeper, you start to see the cracks in it. There's just not a lot of good archaeological evidence to support it in Canaan or in Egypt. The uh, account we read in Exodus does not really align with the Egyptian culture from the 15th century BC. It, just, it fits really well with the Ramazide period. And so these are problems. And then again, the toponyms themselves in the book of Exodus, like Balsafon, Pithon, Ramesses, Migdal, these point to a 19th century or 19th dynasty exodus. Dynasty. Yeah, sorry if I said century earlier. But these point to a 19th dynasty exodus around or in the 1200s, so 13th century. So we need to keep that in mind. The toponyms themselves, as Hoffmeyer has pointed out numerous times, point to this time period. It does not point to an earlier time period or a later time period. Okay. So you're stuck on century. I'm stuck on Corinthians. We're even. I know. <laughs> <laughs> my Fair mind enough. works, my mouth works faster than my mind or whatever it is sometimes. Uh, here's some really interesting comments I want to I want to see you weigh in on. And, and by the way, we've just scratched the surface here. We're not trying to go into all the depth. Our goal here is to just say, here's a position. Here's some big arguments for, against, uh, here's why you shifted your mind. I'm going to come back with a couple scholars in due time and really unpack this. But I think this is an interesting comment here I want to see you you weigh in on. Uh, Jamie Massengale says, If we set the date aside, Mike can build a powerful minimal facts case for the Exodus like Hamramas did for the resurrection. So why is the dating itself such a big deal? Why don't we put together some of these facts, which you, Mike, admittedly say don't matter to the dating itself and just show that a case can be made for the exodus well i think you can really do that with the internal evidence you can make a case for the exodus uh from internal evidence that there's just one half from like minimal facts but i think when you get to the external evidence archaeological data that just aligns with the late date uh and again i was this was, I was reluctant to accept it at first because I was a big early date guy, but that's just okay. what the data shows. And then again, when you start getting into a lot of the details of what the, ex, the book of Exodus records, you know, like toponyms and other things I'd mentioned before, that again points the late date. It just, sure, you can make a very minimal facts case for the, any type of Exodus just from the loan words, the names that are used in there, the uh, customs the book of Exodus records. But if you really want to, if you really want to get a good case, a really strong maximal case you got to go with the late date okay all right F fair enough here's a comment i'm curious to how you would weigh in on this one and i appreciate the question travis statham says do you think other religions do this post hoc rationalizations of their books and i can honest with you mike before you jump in i have some sympathy for this because i ask myself a lot when i go to explain something like the exodus am i just searching stuff that's not there am i explaining this away uh, I see other religions do this, and I'm quick to criticize them. So from the outside, somebody looking in, I can see why they would feel like this is maybe an attempt to do this. Uh, what are your thoughts? So I would say we need to judge things on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, Just because someone's making a case, that does not mean it's post hoc rationalization. Now, nowhere in this have I argued this means God exists. Nowhere did I argue this means Christianity is true. I think a lot of this data could fit with a natural account of the Exodus. I have to admit that. This is just what the data shows. So let's not make these sweeping generalizations. Let's judge each thing by on a case-by-case -case basis. And I, I'll do the same with naturalism, because I've seen naturalists do post hoc rationalization with data that you know a Christian or a theist can present. Uh, but let's not, I don't want it to be wrong for me to make sweeping generalizations about every naturalist. 
That, that's fair. One of the things that's really come to me, and by the way, if you have questions, write question in cap and put it in. We've got about uh, 10, 15 minutes here with, with Michael to see his thoughts, again, defending a 13th century exodus. So there's a ton of comments here, and I apologize if I missed it. Restate at the bottom in caps with question, and I'll do my best to get to uh, as many as, as I can. What role do you think, Michael, worldview plays in this? Because if I've read both 15th century scholars and 13th century Exodus scholars, they both will criticize the larger way, and the word secular is loaded, I understand, but say there's certain worldview that is built in to a minimalist approach to doing history that rejects things in the scripture, such as the story of Moses, unless it's corroborated. So what mm. role do you see, especially with your philosophical background, weighing how we assess the facts and what role should it play? Right, well, that's a good question. I can't speak for everyone. I, I'm so I, I'm not gonna name any individuals because I, I cannot speak to them. But there's something in philosophy of history called a horizon. And what it is is that everyone argues from their horizon and it, the horizon colors how we view the data. So this is talked about in philosophy of history. Everyone has a horizon. Sometimes a lot of minimalist scholars have a horizon as well as maximalist scholars, people that believe in historical exodus. It colors how we see the data. So if we start with the approach that, you know, the, the book of Exodus is a myth. It's talking about things that just did not happen. It can color the way we end up viewing the data. So you'll look for other ways to sort of explain the evidence that you can see that is used to argue for an exodus that, well, maybe it can be explained this way or that way. And you may have a higher standard for like evidence from Moses. I try to argue that we should have something called methodological neutrality. Let's not start with the idea of the Exodus was a myth. Let's not start with the idea of the Exodus is true. Let's start with the idea that just be agnostic and just see where the data leads us. Now that's hard to do. Okay. Uh, I have a horizon, you have a horizon, everyone has a horizon. We're all gonna be coloring how we view the data regardless. But we need to accept that that's the problem. We need to accept that our worldviews do kind of muddy the water for all of us. And we need to try to be fair with the data. Nothing I'm presenting here what I think would be a problem for a skeptic to accept. I don't see why it would be a problem for them to accept that the Hebrews started out in, in Egypt and then left and then ended up in Canaan. There were some natural disasters that happened. They interpreted it that their God was calling them out, and so they left. There's nothing in, incoherent about that. I don't see I, – I have a hard time, honestly, understanding what is the adherence to just rejecting an exodus altogether and just not taking a naturalistic account of the exodus. Fair enough. Kevin O'Connor weighs in with a great question. Uh, Kevin, good to have you. Uh, he's he's weighed in in a few of my uh, live streams here. He says, I missed the entire presentation. You can watch it later. But I'm an atheist who doubts the exodus happened. Do you have an elevator pitch to convince me or at least get me started? Pressure's on, Michael. Go. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah. First of all, go to my channel. Watch my three videos, Exodus okay. Rediscovered. Covers Exodus, Wandering Beard, Conquest. Uh, I talk about a lot of archaeological data. Again, we see that the city was a Avaris was a Semitic okay, that's city. That's going to be a long elevator ride if they're going to watch all your videos in the elevator. <laughs> so that's step two. Give me the elevator that's pitch. We got sixty seconds. Elevator Go. Pitch. Semitic population at Avaris abandoned around the Ramazide period. After that, it was just a cemetery. No evidence of Semit the semi Semitic population state. Generation or so later. Uh, population explosion in Canaan. There was a change at Jericho where the fortified city went missing, placed by a small village. Mount Abal is built, uh, the site there. Shiloh is resettled with distinct Israelite features that even Israel Finkelstein emits. Hazor is burned, and the uh, idols are mutilated in Israelite fashion. And if you study the book of Exodus, there's so many internal clues I cover in my series that point to a late Bronze Age Egyptian culture that later uh, myth makers could not have made up. That was pretty fast, and I didn't even put this on double speed, man. I got to give you some props for that. Uh, I saw a great question here. Uh, Travis again is asking the right question, so let me let me frame it this way, more methodological. He says, "Is faith required to believe this view of the Exodus?" Well, I would need to know what he means by faith. Um, every historical Fair. case is built on probability. Do you have faith that Caesar crossed the Rubicon? Yes, I technically have faith or trust in the early sources that mention it. I don't, no reason to doubt them or to not place my trust in them. 
I have faith that the evidence supports the exodus. But when people use faith, sometimes they use it as like a buzzword to mean like absence of evidence, which it is not. It's more aligned with the idea of trust. Uh, so in terms of historical cases, it's all about probability. I think we have enough evidence to argue the exodus probably did happen. There's just enough uh, evidence there to support it as I detail through my series. I think it's very fair to say every single belief we have to some degree or another has an element of faith. Uh, maybe not as much math, but historically speaking, I learned this again in my research on the apostles, is that history is a matter of probability. Got to look at the quantity, the quality of the evidence, make your best assessment, and go where you think the evidence leads. So if that requires some faith, sure. But I'm not sure it requires more faith than another view that has a different worldview to history. We all have faith. Question is, where do we put it? Uh, here's a question. You commented on this earlier, uh, Michael, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Question, how does a late date explain the Mount Ebal curse tablet? Okay, so first of all, the Mount, the high resolution images of this Mount Ebal curse tablet have not been published. So we, it's not been evaluated yet. We're just going on what ABR has announced. So I'm agnostic on if this is even accurate until we can mm. see the data. And then when mm. it comes out, I'll talk to scholars and see what they say. First of all, the fill that they found this curse, tab curse tablet in cannot date to the 1400s. Uh, Adam Zertal dated this site to 1200s. The pottery, the um, the uh, scarabs there point to a 13th century exodus. They'll mention there was a scarab found there that mentions Tutmothis III. And they'll say, see, this can support it an early date. The problem is, is that, as Dr. Falk has pointed out on his channel, that scarab is, is sort of like a commemorative scarab. It's made in sort of the style of a 19th dynasty. So it'd be like trying to date a cell phone with an Elvis sticker on it. You're not going to date it to the time of Elvis. The scarab itself that mentions Tutmosis assert fits with the styles of 19th dynasty commemorative stilas or commemorative um, scarabs. So all the data at the site points to it being around the 1200s. It does not point being built at a much earlier time. And as for the curse tablet itself, I'll remain agnostic until we see some high resolution images. I want to see what the data says. I'm not going to get excited about it until they actually come out. Fair enough. A good skeptic. I love it. Uh, all right. Here's a question from, <laughs> I just realized the name. I like this, by the way. I think this is another skeptic, probably not a Christian. B.S. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> How dare Su you, sir? Super kudos for that creative name, by the way. Uh, the question is, how do we establish the probability of a spiritual being selectively going through Egypt, slaughtering only firstborn males? Now, let me, I'm just going to reframe this question. How do we establish the probability that God is the cause of the exodus, or does that go beyond probability? So, for example, in resurrection studies, you know this, Michael. One of the things that Michael Cohn has been careful to do is we can assess historically whether Jesus was alive, whether he was dead, and whether people saw him alive afterwards. That's a historical question. But whether Jesus was genuinely resurrected and the spiritual implications, we can assess those, but that's not a historical question. Would you say the same about the Exodus? Or are you just simply asking, does the biblical account, spiritual truths aside, match up with the story and then the spiritual truths go beyond history or would you approach this in an entirely different fashion well i don't think we can argue for the x like i don't think we can use this data that i presented to argue that this proves god exists or this supports god's existence we can use it to support the reliability of the exodus account that what's being handed down is more is more likely to be accurate history what was told but it's all about probability I would not say, aha, I've, I've proved the exodus happened, therefore God exists. I think that's a leap in logic. The only argument I use to argue for Christianity would be the resurrection argument. Uh, beyond that, I'm just arguing for biblical reliability. I do not think this would prove a, you know, a spiritual being exists. Again, if, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, I don't think I'd have enough evidence to be a Christian. I think I'd have enough evidence to be a theist because I can use other arguments like moral, uh, you know, digital physics argument, other cosmological arguments as well but the only argument I use for Christianity is the resurrection argument and then that I argue probabilistically supports the biblical history and what I use to also help support that is things like this like biblical reliability what would cause you to just give up belief in the exodus and if you stop believing in the exodus would you abandon your faith 
That's a good question. I've not really thought about that. I don't, again, my, my faith hinges, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 on the resurrection. Maybe there's something I'm missing in the cultural context about it. If there was no historical exodus, I'm willing to accept that. It would definitely cause me to start to doubt things. If, mm. you know, the Bible, which is, I, I say Christ is behind all of it, says an exodus happened and it didn't actually happen. So that would be an issue for me, I would have to admit. Uh, it would definitely challenge my faith, to be sure. But again, I, I think if I could still make a strong case for the resurrection itself in New Testament reliability, I think I could still find a way to make it work because I'd be conflicted. I'd say, well, there's not a lot of good evidence for the Old Testament stories, but we have all this good evidence for the New Testament, mm. especially the resurrection. Where do I go? I, I can't honestly say entirely what I would do because that's that's something I don't, that's not a position I feel like I'm actually in when it comes to reality. I think we have enough, we have a lot of good evidence for the Exodus, so I don't have anything to worry about. Fair, fair enough. The heart of my faith is in the resurrection itself. But of course, that doesn't make the Exodus unimportant because Moses is one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. And the Exodus is consistently pointed to in Scripture as being true, as proof that God has acted. So not an unimportant event uh, within history. Michael, do you have a sense of where these conversations are going? Like any sense of what we can expect over the next five to 10 years? And obviously these conversations are not as fast as like social media because there's digs and there's peer review, but you spent some time talking to scholars and you've looked into this quite a bit. Any sense of where things are headed maybe coming up in terms of the Exodus and maybe throw the conquest of Jericho in there as well? Sure. Well, again, I'm, at this point, I'm just speculating because I don't know entirely. But we have seen in the past few decades uh, the maximalist camp. When it comes to Old Testament, maximalist believes most of the, uh, the Old Testament is based on history. Minimalists say it's, it's more myth. We've seen a lot more maximalists coming out in the past couple decades. So maximalism is rising among biblical scholars, which is a good thing. So I think that is going to continue to rise. I think we're going to people are going to start taking the biblical account more seriously. I hope we get some more data on Jericho. I, I really hope that we get some more archaeological reports. I know at Hazor, they're still uh, excavating there, hoping to find the archives there. They still even found that. Uh, so again, I just hope there's more archaeological data. I suspect we'll see more maximalist approach, and I'm hoping hmm. uh, that eventually maxil maximalism becomes the majority view again eventually. And I think it will. But again, I'm just speculating. And for those watching, if they're not tracking in these terms, maximalist embraces the, what the scriptures say is a historical record without additional support. A minimalist will only embrace what's in the scriptures if there's archaeology or further writings that support it. Is that a fair way you'd see the difference between those two positions? No, I think that's fair. Yeah. Roughly, very simply put. So you see potentially more people, scholars, moving towards a maximalist position uh, than in the past. Now, we've certainly seen this in the historical David, who uh, there was huge rejection of his existence. And then, of course, you know, the inscription at Tel Dan, the house of David. Now, last time I was in Israel about three years ago, getting a tour, the rabbi said there's almost no reason to doubt that David existed. That's a shift in that direction. So it sounds like you suspect we may see a similar direction towards the exodus and the conquest. Uh, if so, that would be awesome. But you're not a prophet. Fair enough. Hey, let me let you weigh in this one really quickly before before we let you go. Just kind of your quick response. Bradley B., thanks for watching. He says, the fact that Canaan was under the suzerainty of Egypt proves there was no exodus, no evidence. Three million Israelites left Egypt for Canaan. None. Okay. So we have to remember at this time period during the 19th dynasty, Egypt's control over Canaan was declining. And first of all, it was more of a hegemony. They didn't rule over Canaan like the Romans or the Persians did. They ruled over it. Let's just get our tribute. We'll leave. I know we don't care what you do as long as you keep paying us. So there was always sort of like a loose rule. But by the time of the 19th dynasty, the end of Ramesses II's reign, it's starting to decline. Uh, they note in this article of biblical archaeology that around the end of Ramesses II's reign, the time of the conquest, uh, Egyptian forts, garrisons were being burned, likely from the uh, Canaanite king of Gezer. So he's attacking because Egyptian power is waning. Uh, we also see that at the same time, the sea people are moving in. They're taking over coastal regions. Egypt couldn't stop them. Uh, the next pharaoh, Merneptah, 
when he takes reign, Libyans invade from the west and they make it all the way to like the Nile. They get very far in before they're repelled. That would not have happened during the beginning of Ramesses II's reign or during the time of Tutmosis III. They just would have been too powerful. But during the end of Ramesses the reign and the beginning of Merneptah, Egyptian power is declining. This is noted by scholars like Baruch Halpern uh, in this article as well, in this uh, magazine uh, from Biblical Archaeology Review. So around the time of the conquest, we see there's just decline happening. For Merneptah to have gone up and like punished the Israelites' invasion, he would have gone through the realm of the Sea Peoples uh, and then go into the Judean Highlands. It had been very hard, and they didn't just have the supplies or manpower at that point. And again, shortly after, what do we see? Well, you see the Sea Peoples take over basically the coastal mm-hmm. regions of Canaan, and then they are able to even start putting pressure on Egypt. They try to invade during Ramesses III. Okay, that decline was already happening long before that, as scholars have noted. So the idea there could not have been a conquest shows that people are just not familiar with the history here. They don't understand how Egypt ruled over Canaan. They don't understand when the decline started to happen. And I talk about this in Exodus Rediscovered Conquest, and I go over some a lot of, a lot of data to support it. Michael, I really appreciate your perspective. You've obviously put a lot of time thinking about this and also able to communicate it in a way that just non-scholars don't get lost in the weeds and can see why some embrace a 13th century exodus biblically, but also extra biblically. I want to encourage my viewers to check out your YouTube channel, Inspiring Philosophy. You've got some stuff coming up on the documentary hypothesis, but you produce some high quality uh, videos and engage some leading scholars. So check out Inspiring Philosophy. And before you go, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other conversations coming up with non-believers. I can't wait, non-Christians, can't wait for you to see. Also, lots of other archaeological, philosophical, cultural conversations I will be having on this channel as well. And don't forget, if you want to study apologetics, we have the top-rated distance program at Biola University. It's a master's degree in apologetics, and archaeology is a piece of this. Dr. Titus Kennedy will teach in our program from time to time. We'd love to have you if you thought, you know what, I'm not ready for a master's program, but uh, have thought about doing a more formal training. We have a certificate program, and there's actually a significant discount below. So make sure you check it out. Again, Michael, you're a rock star. Appreciate you coming on. This is a lot of fun. I learned a ton myself, and I look forward to having a couple scholars on as a follow-up to really go into the weeds of this in due time. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Very much appreciated.